Spikes is free and it always will be, which is why we need your help. We don't have a paywall or bonus content for paying customers because we want our arguments for freedom and democracy against misanthropy and identity politics to reach as many people as possible. This is why we ask those of our listeners and readers who can afford to, to chip in. One-off donations are hugely appreciated, but monthly donations are even better. They allow us to plan for the future and to grow. Even £5 a month is a huge help. It's much cheaper than your average magazine subscription, and it ensures that Spiked is free and open to all. To make either a monthly or a one-off donation, just go to spikes-online.com and click the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spikes-online.com and the red donate button in the top right corner. Now on with the Spike podcast. Hello and welcome to the Spiked podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me this week, we have Spiked's editor, Brendan O'Neill. Hello. And Spiked columnist, Ella Whelan. Hi. Coming up on the show, what's happened to Boris, a year of Keir Starmer and racist toddlers. I will take that ID card and I will eat it. The Geiger counter of Olympomania is going to go zoink. I can tell you the price of a bottle of champagne. <laughs> How about um, that? You must stay at home. There are ethical issues raised by the idea of COVID a status certification. Cautiously, jab by jab, this country is on the path to reclaiming our freedoms. Boris Johnson was once thought to epitomise the freeborn Englishman. For decades, as a journalist, as mayor or in parliament, he's railed against nanny state diktats, political correctness and state bureaucracy. He even campaigned for Britain's freedom from the clutches of the EU. So what the hell has gone wrong? England is in the fourth month of its third lockdown and the government is pressing ahead with its plans for COVID status certification, aka vaccine passports, as a condition for returning to semi-normality. The same Boris Johnson who railed against ID cards in the 2000s, who even threatened to eat his in front of a policeman if asked to produce one, is hoping to turn Britain into a biosecurity checkpoint state where you have to prove your health status to be granted access to certain services. So, Ella, what's gone wrong? (laughs) Well, it's important to note how many people thought Boris Johnson was a threat before he became Prime Minister. I mean, Boris Johnson was painted, uh, especially in the run-up to the election, as this kind of racist, dangerous, liberty loving in a bad way, you know, people <laughs> who hate freedom thinking, you know, sort of libertarian obsessed buffoon, but that he was actually this kind of intolerant return of a terrible kind of Tory and that there was going to be, you know, hell to pay if he got in. And in fact, he has, rather than, as you say, being the kind of freedom loving individual, he has at every point capitulated either to his fiance on Green Matters, <laughs> to his advisors on how to handle the pandemic, even, you know, the kind of scenes that we saw in years past and, you know, when he was in charge of foreign politics, the kind of the scenes of him being bombastic and playing the kind of fool and not playing by the rules when it came to international relations. I mean, he's played it incredibly safe with the whole Trump situation and incredibly safe with Biden. I'd stretch to say he's boring if it wasn't so important to note the way in which he's capitulated has had an effect on our freedoms. What you really wanted was Boris to have the guts to be able to come good on all the promises he's made in the past when it matters. It's all very well having liberal instincts and this, you know, endless Tory politicians who tell you in defence of Boris Johnson's measures throughout the lockdown that he has liberal instincts and that's something that should make us feel better. But of course, liberal instincts don't mean anything unless those instincts are principled and principles don't mean anything until they're tested. And of course, the last year has been a test and Johnson has failed at, at every hurdle. I mean, even the fact that, remember when he caught coronavirus, obviously a frightening prospect for anyone, but that turning point at which he went from at least suggesting that it wasn't going to kind of a- illegal to shake someone's hand to then becoming this, as you've described, sort of almost cowering, frightened individual who really is all about wanting to make sure that he looks like he's doing things in a safety first approach rather than understanding what freedom means. But as we've said on this podcast, and as Spike has written about for years in relation to Brexit, in relation to other things, Boris Johnson always had the impression of being 
libertarian or freedom loving. He always had that kind of image and perpetuated that image. But in fact, he's a political maneuverer. He does what needs to be done to keep him in power. And what he's needed to keep him in power the last year has been to capitulate. So disappointed, but not surprised. (laughs) Brendan. (laughs) What's becoming increasingly clear is that he is a man of no principles. I don't say that with any pleasure. I think it's quite sad. And people have been asking for a long time, who is the real Boris Johnson? I mean, the debate before this year was the question of whether it was the Boris Johnson who was the mayor of London, who was, you know, pretty cosmopolitan, fairly liberal in certain ways and illiberal in other ways. You know, that kind of slightly hip Tory is how he was seen by some people. Or is the real Boris Johnson the guy who lined up behind red wall voters in 2019 and promised them that he would deliver a real Brexit and defend the nation and secure the borders? There was a huge contradiction between those two Borises too. And people have been asking, who is the real one? And lots of people came to the conclusion that the real one was the mayor of London, Boris, and that the red wall Boris was a bit of an act, wanted to get into power. He knew that the best way to do that was by cozying up to angry working class voters. And that was very, very successful for him. So there's been a long discussion about who Boris really is. And I think the fact that that discussion goes on points to something that Tom Slater wrote about this week, which is that Boris doesn't really believe in anything. And he gets pushed around by one belief after another, and he chops and changes things. He infamously wrote two columns in the run up to the EU referendum. He told his friends that he just couldn't make his mind up. And then we're supposed to believe that he was the huge, important figurehead of vote leave. You know, none of it stacks up. And I think what we've seen over the past year, I mean, I was someone who was fairly sympathetic to the government's plight when COVID-19 first hit. And I still think that the idea that the government is responsible for all the deaths is absolutely ridiculous and perverse, even though they definitely made catastrophic errors in relation to care homes. So they had a difficult situation. It's not as if any other political party in this godforsaken country would have dealt with it any better than they did. But what's really striking now is that as we start to come out of this terrible period, they are stretching the illiberalism into the new normal. And you can see that with the vaccine passports. You can see that with their uber precaution in terms of when they're opening up. And you can just see in the general message they're sending to the public, which is be careful. Freedom isn't everything. Stop moaning about going on holidays. So that the way in which they have gone from being an allegedly reluctant authoritarian government to being a government that has warmed to this authoritarianism in the way that it has, I think that demonstrates that this is a government that is not anchored by principle, but is really driven by a desire to retain power in whatever way they can. I think that's exactly right. And the vaccine passports is the issue that confirms that because we all understand that lockdown, however extreme, obviously has a time limit. It simply cannot go on forever, even if the government wanted it to. But something like vaccine passports or COVID status certificates, no one quite believes Boris when he says they'll be time limited, quite simply because it it fundamentally transforms our relationship to the state and to each other. You know, it, it turns everything on its head. It makes the continued assumption, despite the widespread rollout of vaccines, that we're all plague carriers and we need to prove our safety before we can be allowed to do even the most normal things like possibly going to the pub or going to concerts or going to the theatre. And a kind of transformation like that, you can't expect that to be temporary. You can't believe that they would bring that in and then be able to roll that back anytime soon. I mean, we've seen a similar thing with the policing bill, you know, where aspects of the lockdown are being essentially kept long term to crush protesters. And obviously no one in the government set out to have lockdown in order to hold long-term power. But that is seems to obviously be the effect of this. And when you have someone like Boris, who doesn't have the principles or doesn't have the, you know, the kind of moral resources or the, or the, even the leadership qualities to be able to say, no, this is the wrong direction, then, you know, you're pretty screwed. Ella. It's really important to 
highlight the fact that he, as Brendan says, that he doesn't have any principles because that's incredibly dangerous at a time when massive changes are being made to society. I know we've said it many times on this podcast, but it is just, if you rewind back to February 2020 and told yourself the situation we'd be in now in terms of the restrictions on our lives, you wouldn't believe it. And so, you know, life for ordinary people has changed dramatically in the last year. And you have a government, in particular a prime minister, who has no anchoring into either a, a political plan or a view f- for what the future is, bar kind of nonsense about green future, green build back better, all this kind of really lightweight crap about the environment is really all Boris has for a future plan. But no sense of an answer to the big questions that we are faced with now. I mean, we seriously have to think about how society is going to function in the next few years, what massive changes are going to have to be made to the economy, to the way in which people work, to our quality of life, to the respect for social lives. There's, it's actually in some ways a kind of an exciting time because you think there is scope for so much change here because things have been thrown up in the air. And as with Brexit and other political moments, when things get stirred up, there is the possibility for change. But the flip side of that is if you have a person in political power in the way that a prime minister does, who has no desire to make any success out of that potential for change, and in fact, keeps capitulating to people who, you know, whether it be his political advisors or anyone else who say kind of don't rock the boat, just get through this really kind of short termist approach to politics, then really dodgy stuff can happen without anyone (laughs) blinking an eye. So it's not to kind of be alarmist about Boris Johnson. I think most of us will still roll our eyes when people suggest that he's this terrible threat. In fact, actually, the problem is much more banal. He's so inconsequential and so light when it comes to principles or political ideas that actually things can happen around him and things can change without making him making any kind of significant intervention. Well, talking of inconsequential and principle-free politicians, Keir Starmer has completed his first year as <laughs> Labour leader. Following Labour's historic defeat in the 2019 election, Starmer has set out to decarbonize the Labour Party and strip it of its leftish elements. But in doing so, he's struggled to articulate what Labour is actually for. During the coronavirus crisis, Starmer has supported practically every government restriction and has even been outfoxed by the Conservatives' high levels of public spending. Labour currently trails the Tories by eight points and Starmer's personal ratings lag far behind Boris Johnson's. A shock poll released this week projected that Labour would lose its former red wall safe seat of Hartlepool in the next month's by-election. Brendan, what's gone wrong for Keir? Everything. I mean, he is unbelievably dreadful. He makes Boris look like a man of principle. I mean, he is so vacuous, so empty and so changeable. That's the thing that I find most shocking. He can't hold the ground on anything. I thought that his apology for visiting Jesus House in in London, an African Christian church that doesn't believe in homosexuality and gay marriage and so on, his apology for that I thought was absolutely terrible and a real craven thing to do. And it really summed him up because what you had here was, you know, he was visiting a Christian institution which does really good work in the local community. It's been a COVID vaccine centre. It runs the local food bank. It's encouraging lots of ethnic minority people to be vaccinated. It's doing really good social service in that part of London. And because a few Corbynistas and a few Labourites and a few campaigners in the Labour Party kicked up a fuss about him visiting, he apologised and said, sorry if I caused offence, I won't do it again. He, He can't ever stand his ground. And in the process, he completely insulted those African Christians in London. He completely insulted Christians more broadly. And he demonstrated that he is utterly lacking in backbone. And you see that on every issue now. He simply doesn't have a principled stance. He he copies the government in relation to lockdown. He's got nothing original to say about the past year and the COVID crisis. He still can't recover from the role he played during Brexit. He was one of the main faces arguing for the overthrow of the vote for Brexit and the enactment of a second referendum, which I don't think working class voters in in the North and elsewhere are going to forget anytime soon. So he's really stuck. He's got no political ideas to push. He hasn't got a good historical track record to fall back on. And he has proven himself to be a weather vane. He just twists in the wind whenever anyone demands an apology or demands that he take the knee or demands that he stop saying certain things, stop arguing certain things. I think old Labour voters who switched to the Tories, what they are probably looking for is a principled 
decent politician who will stand up for their interests and make a good case for how Britain should be governed. And Keir Starmer is none of those things. And I'm really looking forward to when Labour loses in Hartlepool because they absolutely deserve to. We cannot forget that Brexit was emblematic of Labour's contempt for for those voters. You know, it wasn't the whole story behind their failure at the last election, but it was a big part of it. I mean, how could they even have countenanced this second referendum policy that, you know, Keir Starmer championed if they had a modicum of respect for the voters in these heartlands? And I mean, even if you looked at the the electoral calculation, if you were a cynic and you were thinking, how, how would Labour win the most seats? You know, it was pretty clear that they not only held more Leave voting seats than Remain seats, they needed to win more Leave voting seats than Remain seats. And yet they went for this essentially Remain policy because even though there are more Brexit voters, those people simply don't matter as much. Their voices don't count as much as the kind of middle class metropolitan liberal elite, as that cliched phrase to use it, but it's true. It doesn't matter as much as those voices who are Labour members or make up the bulk of Labour MPs and make up the bulk of the pressure and the people, whichever Labour leader is in charge at the time, whispering in their ear. And so, yeah, I agree. That's why Keir is clearly not the man to reverse that. He played a really important role in that. So yes, they deserve to keep losing and uh, keep failing badly. Ella. Almost makes you miss Corbyn because the thing about Corbyn was in certain situations had something to say. He had certain political background. He had ideas. He didn't agree with a lot of them, but there was some kind of substance. And of course, we know they, you know, were tested and around Brexit, they didn't come good. But the thing about Keir Starmer is he is the perfect Labour leader for the Labour Party at the moment. And he was celebrated for having this, you know, legal background. He was a safe pair of hands. He's, as centrist as they come. He's kind of, you know, suits everyone because he says nothing and has done the most despicable thing, which is pretty much define his entire time as Labour leader as in opposition to Corbyn, as, you know, in Mm. in trying to denigrate the Corbyn years, not realising that actually at least something was happening to a certain extent within the Labour Party during those years. But the really important thing that people kind of forget about him is that he actually his background, especially in his role as Director of Public Prosecutions, he had a central role in defining some of the things that are now posing a problem. So the you know the reason why he was particularly quiet around the time when the Kill the Bill protests were happening around the police bill over the last month was because if you look back in 2012 in his role, he released guidelines. It was around the time that the student protests were kind of kicking off and he released guidelines that allowed police to prosecute protesters if there was significant disruption to public and businesses. So everyone's spending all their time slagging off Priti Patel. Keir Starmer, you know, laid the ground for those kind of crackdowns on protest a decade ago. And so he's got this really quite a liberal history and then finds himself at the head of a party which claims to be about the interests of the working man, the working man's out on the street to a certain dis- extent protesting and he, he has nothing to say. You know, the, the frustration that I think we've had for many years with the Labour Party is that they just won't die. It just won't <laughs> uh, crumble despite the fact that it's losing votes left, right and centre and it has nothing to say. But I think if that's why Keir Starmer really signifies that kind of stagnant situation the Labour Party finds itself in, because he just plays it safe the whole time. I mean, it really can't be overstated that a party that's supposed to be in opposition to middle and upper class Tories has had nothing to say about the way in which the lockdown has destroyed working class lives throughout the year and instead has played it safe simply on the basis of not wanting to look like they're being oppositional. I mean, if an opposition doesn't want to look oppositional, what the hell is the point of it? And (laughs) Keir Starmer really embodies that pointlessness of Labour. Spikes is producing more content than ever. And I know you want to keep up with all the fantastic articles, essays, podcasts and interviews that we're publishing every day. If you never want to miss anything we do, make sure you sign up to our daily newsletter. It's called Today on Spiked. Every weekday, you'll get a roundup of all of Spike's content, plus some exclusive commentary from the Spike team, usually Tom Slater or myself. To get all of that, just go to spikes-online.com forward slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked now. Now, back to the Spike's podcast.
A coalition of teaching unions and charities has published new guidance calling for nursery staff to receive training in white privilege, systemic racism, and how racism affects children and families in early year settings. Since last year's Black Lives Matter protests, we've become used to demands to decolonize university and school curricula and for diversity and implicit bias training to tackle institutional racism. And now we're being told that even babies and toddlers have to learn to recognise their skin colour and potentially their racist behaviours. According to this guidance, colour blindness and treating children equally should not be considered and will only entrench existing racism. Brendan, what have you made of this? I think it's really shocking, actually. I mean, it's equally ridiculous and shocking. Uh, it's ridiculous because, you know, the idea of bringing critical race theory to nurseries, you know, interrupting <laughs> playtime or time in the sand pit or whatever kids do in nurseries these days with, you know, lectures about white privilege or information about race is preposterous and surreal. But at the same time, it's, it's genuinely shocking and it shows how far the identitarian crusade is going. We've known for a long time, we've talked a lot about how problematic the identitarian crusade is, the way it rehabilitates racial thinking, it encourages us to obsess over race, obsess over skin colour, to determine how we engage with people according to whether they are black or white or Asian or whatever else it might be. That's been going on for a long time, but the fact that it's now stretching to kids who don't think about this stuff at all really demonstrates that they want to get them at an early age. They really do want to start this stuff very early on and basically turn out what I refer to as racially aware children and racially aware young adults. And in my mind, racial awareness is exactly what we should be arguing against. We want less racial awareness, not more. We want people to be unaware of race and to think about people as individuals rather than as representatives of an ethnic or racial block. So it's deeply disturbing. I think it demonstrates something we've known for a while, that anti-racism, so-called anti-racism, has completely lost its way. Anti-racism was one of the most important political causes of the 20th century and earlier, radically transformed humankind for the better, right from the civil rights movement to anti-racist campaigns in the UK to national liberation struggles, anti-colonialism. These were all wonderful leaps forward for humankind. But recently, anti-racism has become this utterly bourgeois, elitist campaign that is designed to divide the public, police our thoughts, change the way we think, and re-racialize us in a new way. And the way in which anti-racism has gone from being a noble cause to being this top-down, authoritarian, divisive agenda, that's really worrying. And I think more needs to be done to kick these people out of public life, especially out of schools and nurseries. The expansion of these ideas into every single domain is, is very revealing. I mean, this week as well, teaching unions also called for every school subject to include black history, explicitly including science subjects, you know, maths and food tech, and basically subjects where you don't learn much history at all also had to be given over to black history. I mean, there's just no limit to this kind of interference. You know, there's no limit to what can be deemed racist. And with this guidance for toddlers and nursery staff, you know, seemingly you're racist from the day you're born. You're racist in how you behave, how you speak, even in your unconscious, unexpressed thoughts, you're racist. And it just completely denigrates the seriousness of the charge of, of racism. That seems to be its main very, you know, tragic effect. If everything is racist, then nothing is. Ella? Well, it's also a really instrumental way of looking at education. I mean, in terms of food tech, if you wanted to teach kids how to cook different cuisines from around the world, you do it because it's fun and because they taste good and because <laughs> it's you know a nice thing to do rather than it being about training you out of a certain mindset that it, you know if you eat more curry, you'll become less racist. I mean, it's just, it's really <laughs> insulting and an awful kind of way to look at education. But in particular with, and Joanna Williams wrote about this this week, in particular with the move to include discussions about and training about white privilege or racism in the early years in nurseries, you know, babies to five-year-olds. What that really is saying is that racism is innate, that actually mm. 
if children of that age, still in nappies, are racist and, you know, kids who can't talk yet, you know, can't say anything racist yet, but are supposedly inherently in their being racist, it completely changes what we understand racism to be. I mean, racism is a societal product. It's about some people reacting to the political situation they're in, their environment they're in. It isn't a kind of thing that you are born with. I mean, that, and Joanna mentions this in her column, you know, previous anti-racist campaigns used to have pictures of babies with a sign saying, you won't find racism here. And the here was on the baby's foreheads. It actually can change the way we understand racism to be a serious thing that can be eliminated. You know, as Brendan mm. says, that you can have a post-racial or non-racial or whatever you want to call it future in which we don't talk about race anymore. But then the flip side of that is if, okay, if they don't think it is innate, then there's also this really, really, I think, dangerous and insulting suggestion that what nurseries really have to do is train kids to unlearn the negative things that they have soaked up from their parents. It's a really anti-parent stance. Both parties have form with this and the Labour Party's Sure Start programme in the 90s was really all about taking working class kids away from their parents as quickly as possible and putting them into state run institutions, nurseries, where they would basically unlearn all the bigoted and uneducated mm. crap from their awful parents and spend some time with middle class kids and pick up their kind of righteous ways. And there's a real element of that in this, which is that, you know, you would have to have conversations with young children about why what they've picked up from their families is wrong. And you can really imagine, you know, kids coming in and saying things that they might have heard their parents saying, and the implicit understanding being that the parental home is just a hotbed of racism and all different kinds of isms, and that, you know, the state and education system's business is to train that out of kids. I mean, I can imagine there are some parents feeling absolutely disgusted by this and breaking down that trust just on that sort of basic level between parents and nursery staff or school staff later on is really, really terrible. Mm. Brendan, final point. Ella makes a very good point and Joanna made it too in relation to the fact that this is now being extended to babies and very, very young children is really striking because I think what that demonstrates is that so-called anti-racism now very clearly plays the role that racism used to play. I mean, it used to be the racists who said that even children were problematic because there was a biologically determining factor. You know, if you were, if you had white skin, you were good. If you had black skin, you were probably bad or you, you might turn out bad. There was a biological determinism in relation to race. There was a social determinism in relation to it as well. The idea that black culture would warp black people and make them problematic. All of those poisonous racist ideas that people spent so long arguing against are making a comeback in relation to so-called anti-racism. We're now told that people are born racist, they have to be cleansed of their sin, they have to be corrected, they have to be enlightened by the wise ones. It's given rise to a racially obsessed authoritarian country, and that is the key argument for why we've got to push back against identity politics and make the argument for humanist politics. Thank you for listening to the Spiked Podcast. We'll be back next week, but in the meantime, make sure you keep up with all the latest from Spiked by signing up to our daily newsletter today on Spiked. Just go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters to sign up now.